Good morning, church. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for all the blessings that you pour upon us, Lord. Thank you that this week we've been able to find some time to be with friends or family and to be able to celebrate this uh, event we call Thanksgiving, and hopefully we've had some time to give you thanks. And Lord, we pray that as we move forward in our worship service this morning, that your spirit would be present here with us, and that you would bless us above and beyond what we could ever imagine. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know how many of you, when you were young, heard of Aesop's fables. Uh, growing up in Italy, my mom would always uh, narrate some, one of Aesop's fables to me from time to time, this uh, very, very wise Greek philosopher by the name of Aesop. And I was really impressed with these fables. In fact, uh, I still remember many of them in my mind. I still remember many of these wonderful fables that my mom would tell me. There was one that probably most of you know about, most of you have heard, and it's one that's uh, about a, a dog who had just gotten a bone from a butcher, and he is taking it home so that he can eat it in his peace and quiet time. And as, as he is making his way home, he's traversing a little brook, so he goes by a little bridge, and as he looks down, he sees his reflection of himself holding a bone. Now, he doesn't know that it's his reflection, the story goes. And so he thinks that it's another dog with another bone. So what does he do? He decides uh, that he's going to go after that bone. So as he goes to chop after that bone, the way the story says is he drops his bone into the water, he jumps into the water to get that bone, nearly uh, drowned, makes his way on the other side with no bone, nothing. And that's the end of the story. And then there is a moral. There's always a moral to the story. And that is, uh, in this story specifically, was about coveting. You know, accept what you have, enjoy what you have, don't go for more. And that was, that was the whole point. There was something about our broken nature that we want more than we have. Last week we talked about in the garden when Adam and Eve were in the garden and, and the serpent came by and he begins to make these assumptions, he begins to make these accusations about God. He's basically saying, hey listen, God is holding out on you. He doesn't want you to be as smart. He doesn't want you to be as wise. He doesn't want you to have this stuff. And that's why you cannot eat of the fruit. And if you ate of the fruit, you would have more. And ever since that moment, we are, we are broken. We, we want more. And I've noticed that it starts very young. I don't know about you, but I've seen kids get pretty insistent and demanding. I've seen kids get pretty violent at times. I remember one time when Brianna must have been maybe two years old, uh, Nancy was, uh, had a friend, and, and she brought her little boy over. His name was Jason. Uh, and they, uh, the kids were playing, and I was a little bit protective. I'm like, this is a little boy. Little two-year-olds can get pretty intense, pretty, pretty uh, violent at times, you know, and, and so I'm just keeping an eye on them, and then, and then at some point, uh, they go upstairs. They kind of climb upstairs a couple of steps to the side where Brianna has her room with her toys, and now they're out of sight, and I'm like, oh, man, this is bad. You know, I'm, my protectiveness as a dad comes in, you know. And then all of a sudden, I hear screaming and crying, and I'm like, yep, it happened, you know. And I make my way upstairs, and poor little Jason is crying hysterically because uh, Brianna whacked him because he took one of her toys. And like, that's mine. That's my. I think that's the second word that little boys and girls learn. The first word is no. The second word is, it's mine, mine, mine right? Sharing is not in their vocabulary. Uh, I came across this thing called the toddler property laws. The toddler property laws goes like this. If I like it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it home from you, it's mine. If I had it a little while ago and now you have it, it's still mine. If it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. If I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. If it looks just 
like mine, then it must be mine. Number eight, if I think it's mine, it's mine. Number nine, if it's yours and I steal it, it's mine. And number 10, if I see it, it's mine. Of course, you and I know very well that it doesn't stop there. As we get older, we have the it's mine mentality. We want more. Now, we get a little bit more sophisticated about it, but the message is loud and clear. Back in the 80s, there was this bumper sticker uh, that said, he who dies with the most toys wins. I don't know if anybody remembers that bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys wins. This week, all Americans traveled across this dark abyss again. We do it every year. We go from Thanksgiving, very next day, something we call Black Friday. Think about that. The day that has been set aside for thankfulness is followed by the greediest day. Have you noticed that? Thanksgiving, a day to selflessly reflect upon all our many blessings, followed by Black Friday, a day that reflects our darkest, selfish corners of our hearts. As if a paranormal, pivotal moment where we go from thankful for to I want more. We go from grateful to cartful. We need a smarter phone. We need a flatter TV because the newspaper says so. And you can get it at a great price, especially if you get there early enough and are willing to be there and brave the cold and maybe even step on somebody's toes. As if the prince of the world says, okay, enough, enough thankfulness. How can I swiftly neutralize the encouraging, hope-filling effects of thankfulness? And how, how can I immediately counteract it, snuff it out, this kind of anti-thankfulness, and have any spark towards gratefulness? And he says, oh, it's easy. I just invent something that causes humans to be rude, violent, greedy, ungrateful. That's called Black Friday. I read this morning that Elon Musk became the second richest man in the world. 100, catch this, 128 billion dollars. Wow. Up until this week, Bill Gates was the second with $127 billion. But because of Tesla and because of the uh, space launch, he went to 128 and surpassed Bill Gates. He's pretty stoked about it. Of course, the number one spot still held by Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, Bezos, right? Whose fortune is listed at $182 billion. So they got some way to go. But I don't know, maybe it's just me. <laughs> I'm thinking after a million dollars, that's plenty. <laughs> I'm not sure why we're going to go to 1 billion or 2 billion or 10 billion or, or 30 billion. I, I don't know what the point is, except for I need more. I need more than the next person. I want to be the richest person concept. You know, the wisest man that ever lived, he is mentioned in the Bible, his name was Solomon. I think he has some advice for us that I want to look at this morning. And it's found, uh, so before we go there, by the way, I just want to kind of give you a picture of how wealthy he was. Uh, because it's hard to see it in contracts, you know, of today when we think about $182 billion. Well, of course, in contrast, uh, Solomon did not have $182 billion. However, if you were to take the, the eras 
you would know that Solomon had way more than Jeff or Bill. Or Elon. So 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 1 through 7, kind of gives you a picture of how wealthy Solomon was. And it goes like this. When the queen of Sheba, the queen of Sheba, heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Okay, you got wisdom? Let's see. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold, precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. The Queen of Sheba, she's got this. She's rich. She's wealthy. She's bringing carts of gold, for goodness sake. Solomon, verse 3 says, answered, all our questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, catch this, the food on his table, the seating of the officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearer, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, the Bible says she was overwhelmed. This queen, this very wealthy, rich, just has it all kind of a person here. This queen now goes to see Solomon, and she is overwhelmed by his wisdom, by his wealth. And she said to the king these words, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the reports I heard. Not even half of what I heard was, was true. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. Can you say abundance? I mean, this guy had everything. Now, now that we know how wealthy he was, now that we know how good he was, how wise he was, and all that he was, and, and how famous he was. Let's see what he tells us about wealth, and what he tells us about thankfulness, and what he tells us about contentment. We go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 4, and I want you to listen carefully to what Solomon says. This is so powerful. He says, and I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. In other words, he's saying, look, man, I've been there. I know. Listen, I just, just, you just need to know that most people they want their ambitions, their desire to achieve is, is based on one thing. On Their motive is this, envy. It's a I want to be better than motive. And the effect, ultimately, he says, is that they're chasing after the wind. Hmm. Basically, what Solomon is saying is that comparison leads to discontentment. I think most of us know that most Facebook posts have these unrealistic pictures of people's lives, right? It's always the happy stuff, right? Unless somebody's in a pity party, that's a whole different story. But for the most part, you know, oh, look what I'm doing and look what I've done. We, don't, we never talk about the times that we're going through challenges and, and it's, it's, it's always, we're always, so we're always comparing to this person that's Wow, look at what she has, and look at what he has, and why don't I have that? Oh, look, this person just bought a brand new house. What a beautiful house. Wow, I got to drive up, and there's a gate. I got to, wow, that's amazing. And we actually press like on it. But inside, envy. Not happiness, Solomon says. 
not fulfillment, no finish line, no winner, no peace. There will always be someone faster, prettier, handsomer, richer, smarter, better. It's a meaningless pursuit, he says. Not joy, just elusive wind. You're just chasing after the wind. And when you're chasing after the wind, you cannot see it. There is no, no way that you could ever catch up to it. It's elusive. Comparison. When we live those kinds of lives, comparison steals the joy from our accomplishments. Comparison steals the joy from those moments when we want to celebrate because we're always thinking that somebody has it better than us. And I want you to know I fall into this trap too and I have to keep reminding myself. I say to myself, I will not chase the wind. I wake up in the morning and say, okay, not this morning. I am not chasing the wind. The next time that you're tempted to compare, ask yourself, do I want to waste my time chasing the wind? Chasing more will always leave us wanting more. So now Solomon, as he continues this passage, has some real wisdom for us because what he is saying is, this is important, he knows what we're thinking here. We're like, well, wait a minute, so ambition? We shouldn't be ambitious? We shouldn't be achieving stuff? I mean, what is he saying here? So Solomon knows this, and he's not inviting us to a passive life, ambitionless, passionless pursuits. No. In fact, he continues with the very next verse, Ecclesiastes 4, Ecclesiastes 4 verse 5, he says these words, Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. In other words, they're like, well, you know, since I can't keep up, why bother? And he says, you know, if you're going to do that, you're just going to be a fool. In other words, what he's saying is don't take this to an unhealthy extreme. That's not the point that I'm making here. The point I'm making here, Solomon says, is about comparison, not achieving. It's about uh, wanting more and better than the next person, not ambition. And so Solomon would say that only a fool would do that. So being unproductive is not the answer, just, just so you know what I'm talking about here. But so what is he saying? I love this. In the very next chapter, he says very beautifully, as only Solomon could say in his wisdom, he says, Ecclesiastes 4 verse 6 says, better, watch the imagery, I love this, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toils and chasing after the wind. Are you catching that? Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Tranquility. In other words, what he's saying is that, that it is better to have this, this peace, this contentment with who you are and what you have than chasing after the wind. Tranquility is being at ease with what God has designed you to be, with God, what God has provided for you and for me. I have so many friends who, 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 who are not believers who say to me, why did you become a pastor? I mean, you knew you were going to be poor. Well, you know, the truth is that I didn't do it for the money. I did it for something way greater than that. I did it for the satisfaction and fulfillment of partnering with God to advance his kingdom. And you can't pay me enough to change that. Now, I wish I could tell you that uh, I am now no longer dealing with comparison. No, no, I find myself saying, man, how did she preach that sermon? How did he say that that way? How did, where did he get that mind from? You know? And so I compare myself that way too. So it's not like we are uh, unable to do that. Of course we are. We just have to find another way so that we say, no, no, I'm not chasing that wind either. Being satisfied with where God is and is leading you. Contentment, that inner peace that does not strive for contest. 
does not crowd or elbow itself into notice. Contentment. You know, it is said of Jesus, I love this, it is said that Jesus was never elated by applause nor dejected by censure. Hmm. Jesus, never elated by applause nor dejected by censure. Man, I, I just, I wish to get to that point in my life. So much of my energy, our energy, our time is wasted in trying to legitimize our contribution instead of trusting God. So Solomon says, stop. Stop leapfrogging from one activity to another, hoping that happiness or the happiness high will stick. Stop chasing wind. Because it never does. We become slaves to performance. Climbing ever higher and higher. And Solomon's saying, listen, you need to adopt a kingdom view, a fresh perspective to see as God sees you. Have an eternal perspective of what really matters. Because if you really think about it, you and I, right now, have so much to be thankful for. Yes, even in the midst of this pandemic, there is so much that we have, so much more that that God wants to let us in on if we only would be content with what we have. And it's so hard to move forward without that contentment. I had a, an old, old uh, Volvo that was just, just a jalopy, to be honest with you. But I drove it till it died. And I remember uh, just feeling like, man, why can I not have a better car than this? And I remember I had a friend of mine who said, you know, Sergio, it's a matter of perspective. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, you know, King Solomon would have loved to have had a, a carriage like that one. I'm like, yeah, you know, you're right. <laughs> you will never be who God designed you to be as long as you're comparing yourself to anyone else. That's the reality. In fact, Jordan Peterson, uh, in one of his books, he writes this, these, these very wisdom-filled words. He says, compare yourself with who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. When I was a teacher elementary school teacher. I remember uh, sitting in this little corner called the worship corner with my students, and I had a, uh, a small, a young um, Korean student, second grade on earth, his name was Sun Chung. And I remember asking them, I would ask all of them, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And of course you'd get astronaut, I want to be a ballerina, I want to be this, I want to be that. But I got to Sun Chung, and Sun Chung says, Ah, oh, Chris, I want to be me when I grow up. I love that about him. I want to be me when I grow up. There's a established songwriter. He's long dead now. His name is Irving Berlin, and probably none of you know who Irving Berlin is, but some of you do good, some of you that are a little older. <clears throat> but he's written songs like God Bless America, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, so I know you've heard some of his songs, right? And he was in an interview uh, for the San Diego Union. He was asked, is there any question that you've never been asked that you would like someone to ask you? And he thought about it a little bit. He said, yeah, yeah, there is one, he replied. And here's the question. What do you think of the many songs you've written that didn't become hits? And he says, my reply would be that I still think they are wonderful. Just because they didn't become hits, they're still amazing. See, God too, has this unshakable delight in what and whom he has made. He thinks each of us, his children, as wonderful. And whether they're a hit in the eyes or, or of others or not, it doesn't matter to God. You're a hit in God's eyes. Why? Because he created you. Contentment. 
this long-lasting joy, this deep inner serenity that comes from knowing beyond a shadow of a, of a doubt who you really are as a child of God. Soul-satisfying pleasures of living on purpose, knowing that you're fulfilling your design and you're not the sum total of other people's opinions. In fact, I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 18, verse 19. He says, he brought me out into a spacious place and he rescued me because he delighted in me. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are in a spacious place right now? Do you believe that God delights in you? I remind myself of this every single day because it is so easy to be discouraged. So, what are you thankful for? What are you thankful for this year, this Thanksgiving? Go home, make a list. Ten of your favorite things to see. Like, for example, the color of leaves on a crisp autumn day. A bountiful spread of Thanksgiving Day. Turkey and, and all the fixing. Fresh mozzarella for me, let me tell you. Your grandchildren or little ones sleeping. I don't know. What do you love to see? And then make a list of your ten favorite sounds. A distant train whistle. Nancy and I, we love seagulls on the beach so much that we actually have this sound thing that we, we put on at night sometimes when we go to sleep, that our seagulls are, we're, we're imagining we're at the beach and we're hearing seagulls on the beach, the waves of the ocean, a crackling fire on a bitter cold day, the church singing at the top of their lungs, the sound of silence. Nancy's voice in the morning when it's just a little raspy. What are you thankful for? Make your own list at home of all the things you are thankful for. And why not include a short sermon on Thanksgiving weekend? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for making us your delight. Thank you, Lord, for the spaciousness that you have given us, even though sometimes we don't recognize it. Please, Father, help us to let go of the I want more mentality. Help us to get out of better and smarter and prettier than someone else. But help us to compare ourselves with who we were yesterday. And may we continue to be and become who you have designed us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. God bless, and we'll see you guys next week.